Welcome everyone to Community Group Night. We want to give a special shout out to all of our campuses, Airdrie, Bear Spa, Central, and South. My name is Josh and this is Austin. And tonight we're going to be continuing our series called Run to the Father, where we talk about why we are best off when we go to God with our fears, anxieties, and troubles. Yeah, last week Josh was speaking at the summit about how we can run to the Father no matter what mental health battles we are facing. You see, the Father desires for us to give Him our burdens and He wants to give us rest in exchange. We are seen as valuable to our Heavenly Father, as Matthew 6 talked about, and we're not meant to do this on our own. All we have to do is ask for His help to approach Him, to run to Him. And so we called this series Run to the Father because we want to talk about the many ways we can go to God and seek out His comfort. See, one of the things one of the themes we actually want to talk about and bring through this series is that God has given us a weapon to combat our fears and anxieties. It's not a gun or a knife. No. It's actually the Word of God. Yeah. And last week I talked about how we can learn to use the Bible and the truths inside of it to be our greatest weapon in the battle to maintain our mental health. Using this weapon starts with first identifying the verses in the Bible that help us run to the Father. Second is memorizing those verses and third is praying those verses and using them as a weapon to combat the battles of your mind. We'll, we'll make sure that we get to this idea a little bit later on in the evening as well. But first, we, want, we wanted to get started with a fun question yep. for you guys. What is the weirdest fear you have? <laughs> now, we don't just mean any old fear like spiders or public no. speaking. <laughs> we want you to pick your weirdest fear. The weirdest one. <laughs> the thing that stresses you out probably that no one else will even think about. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see you guys in a few minutes. Austin, what is your weirdest fear? Okay, so this may not quite be a fear. It's close enough, but it's very stressful for me and it's very odd, it's very weird. I hate setting up all the pieces to a board game. I, and I love board games, but if I'm the one who has to put out all the different pieces, like some in here and make sure everyone has these, oh, I hate that kind of stuff. Really? Which is, which is really nice. <laughs> yeah, it stresses me out. I don't know what it is. It, 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 <laughs> So what we do at home is Beck always sets up the board games for, okay. for, for us when we play, which is really nice. It sounds <laughs> like a good partnership. Yeah, I'm very thankful That's what for marriage it. should be, right? <laughs> Man, I think um, my weirdest fear is probably nails on a chalkboard oh. <laughs> or something resembling yeah. that sound. It literally does the weirdest thing to my body. I feel like my skin is trying to leave my body. Your I skin. can't explain it. Yeah. I just like, I can't. I, I like know what it. you mean though. That sound <laughs> is, is the worst sound. <laughs> So uh, each of us has fears. Some of them are weirder. Some of them are fairly normal, actually. Uh, Jesus even had a fear of death, which is something I think most of us fear too. And so today we want to look at Jesus right before his death and see how he handled this fear um, and also how he handled loneliness that he felt right before he died. Um, before we get too far into it, though, let's pray together, guys. Uh, dear God, we thank you so much for this day, for this time. We thank you for the opportunity to talk about our fears uh, as well as our loneliness and see how you handled them when you were here on earth. God, I pray that you would teach us new things about how we can um, be better at managing our own mental health and more importantly, how we can come to you with our challenges and seek out your support in it. In your name we pray, amen. 
Tonight, we're going to spend most of our time looking at one passage in scripture. We actually want you to lead a lot of the conversation and want to give you more questions and a lot more time in your groups to talk and find the answers together. Today's passage is found in the book of Matthew, which is the first book in the New Testament. We're going to be looking at chapters 26, verses 36 to 45. So in your Bible, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 26. And this is what it says. Then Jesus went, to, went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go and over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he turned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Now, at this point in the story, Jesus is just about to be arrested and put to death, and he knows it's coming. You can see that his anxiety levels are maxed out, but in his time of greatest need, his disciples are caught sleeping. Literally caught sleeping. They're not there. What stands out to you guys about how Jesus reacts to his fear and his loneliness? What is surprising about what Jesus does, or maybe more importantly, what he doesn't do? We're going to give you guys a couple minutes to talk about it. Welcome back. I hope you were able to pinpoint one of the ways Jesus reacted to his fears and loneliness. There's a lot of things we can learn from what happened to Jesus during his time on earth. And it's important that we look to his example and learn from it. The first thing we see in the story about Jesus is that he was overwhelmed with fear and anxiety. So let's read that verse again. Matthew 26. Verses 37, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. 
Going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. As we talk about this, it's important that we clarify that Jesus feels the same emotions that we do. He feels the stress, the loneliness, and the fear. It's all real for him, just like it is for us. He's not different in that way. Now, the difference is how Jesus responds to these emotions he's feeling. He never lets them take control of his attitude or his actions. And this is where we need to learn and grow. Let's start at the root of the problem. Most of our anxieties are the results of us not being able to control our fears. True. Let's take a test at school, for example. We're afraid of failing a test, that's the fear, so we study and we study and we study to try to help. But often, we still feel anxious about that test, no matter how hard we study. Why is that? We're gonna take a second in our groups to chat about that. Welcome back. So why does our anxiety stick around even when we try as hard as we can to fix them and make them go away? The truth is that we are not in control of the things we're fearful about. And that is why so many of us can't shake our anxiety no matter how, how hard we try. Let's go back to our test example. We are afraid of our tests, so we study hard, but we feel incredibly anxious. Yeah, maybe even more than before we started studying. Exactly. And so, why is that? For many of us, we are trying to overcome our fear by controlling it. Yeah. The issue is that we can't. In our test-taking example, no matter how hard we try, we can't guarantee things will work out. We can't guarantee we can pass. Sure, we can study hard, but this doesn't guarantee anything. What if there's a question we aren't expecting on the test? Yep. Or you forgot to practice a specific thing? For some of you, anxiety is already bubbling up inside. Just talking about this. Yeah. <laughs> so let's take a look at what Jesus does to process his own anxiety and the things he can't control. Yeah. Our verse shows Jesus processing his fear about his own death. He knows he is about to go through this horrible, horrible experience, and the emotion of it has it, they described it as overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. This is extreme emotion. This is way bigger than a test. And yet, look at how he chooses to handle his emotions. He goes straight to God. Why? Because unlike you and me, God does have control of the situation that we're in. Jesus recognizes this immediately, that his concerns are the result of a lack of control. So he goes to God, 
who has control, complete control in fact. The hard truth is that some of us have become complete control freaks in our own lives. That was me. I can be a huge control freak. See, my wife has been sick for a long time with some really life-threatening health conditions and through the years of us being married, I was doing anything I could to try to make her feel better and help with her sickness. But at the end of the day, I'm powerless before her condition. The things I would do would only make a slight difference at best in her overall health. And it drove me mad, I mean literally drove me mad. I was so afraid of losing her and the fear was something I wanted so badly to control. But I, I can't control it. So I would just get mad, I would get angry. There were times where I would be so upset at her as if she could somehow control what was going on in her body. But here's the truth, that at the end of the day, only God has control over her life. Not me, not her, but God. And so I began to shift my focus and my prayers and energy towards trusting that if she was going to be better, it would be by the power of God, not my power. This shift in focus was centered around the idea that God is always working for our good and for his glory, which is a promise that we can find in Romans 8, verse 28. Since I have given up my control of my fears and instead ran to God, I've found that the anger and the anxiousness have been so much more manageable. And that has brought me more peace than I had ever experienced before, back when I was trying to be a control freak. See, now we need to take a moment to be clear. Trusting in God doesn't mean what you want most will now just come to pass. No. Look at that. Look at what Jesus says in the garden. Yet, not as I will, mm -hmm. but as you will. Just because Austin dealt with his fears doesn't mean that Beck is now healthy. No. Or that because we trust God will help us through our test means that we will now always get hundreds. No, definitely not. The the point of all of this is that we learn to manage the tension and the fear in anxiety in a healthy way. Yes. Not that they just go away. We're going to hear another story from a youth in our ministry. Her name is Maddie. And Maddie tells us about her journey with anxiety and loneliness. See if you can see some similarities between her story and our lesson. Hey, my name is Maddie and this is my story. So I grew up in a Christian home. I know, shocking. My parents were so amazing and always encouraged me and demonstrated what it meant to be Christian. They also really showed me just how to love those around me when it's really hard. <laughs> I also have two older sisters and the best way I can put it is they're just my built-in best friends. <laughs> so yeah, they're pretty cool. So growing up for me, it looked a little bit different than most. When I was born, I was diagnosed with a rare blood disorder called neutropenia. So basically my body couldn't fight against infections like it was supposed to. So for the first few years of my life, I had to be taken in for weekly and even daily blood tests. And so from what I know, that's where a lot of my anxiety stemmed from. As I got older, that anxiety grew and changed as I did. It took a toll on how I interacted with others and would often distract me from the goodness of God. I would get stuck in a negative thought pattern telling myself to always expect the worst about others and circumstances. I had very few people in my life that I trusted and would always try to handle everything on my own. But honestly, it's exhausting. When I would go to church and learn about how God could take away my anxiety and carry my burdens, I found it really hard to believe. I knew He could, but I didn't know how even to begin to let someone do that for me. For years, I lived life as if God was something I knew about but didn't deeply know. I began to hide things from my family, I lost friends, and I felt as though I lost a bit of my faith and my hope. I could no longer sleep because a pit of fear that would grow in my stomach every night making me sick. Life had lost its appeal and I was too afraid to do anything about it. But one night, that pit in my stomach, it never came and instead I felt a wave of relief, courage, and just intense peace. I wasn't quite sure what that was in the moment, but now it's so clear. God never gave up on me. 
After that night, I started to find support within my family and with those around me. Faith and hope slowly became a part of my life again. I lost myself, but because of God's never-ending love, I found who I was in Him. In those dark moments, I remember this one verse, Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious about nothing, but in everything, with prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your requests to God. When I was young and would have anxiety attacks, my mom would pray this verse over me, and this was the only thing that gave me peace. Sometimes it takes hitting rock bottom to realize how much you need God. I still struggle with anxiety daily in different ways, but now I know that God is holding my hand ready to carry whatever burden I have. My struggles did not disappear overnight, but as I started to lean on God, every day it seemed to lessen little by little. Battling anxiety is a long, ongoing journey that can't be fought on your own. We aren't strong enough, but God is. So I want to encourage you to invite God into your life daily and find community that will encourage you in your faith. This can look like writing down your anxieties and handing them over to God through prayer, or by memorizing a verse and sharing it with friends so that when you become anxious, you can remember that God is with you. He is so much bigger than your anxiety. Trust me, when you finally decide to surrender everything to Him, He will radically change every aspect of your life. So don't lose hope. Life is a difficult journey, but God will give you the strength you need to get through it. You just have to let Him carry those burdens that you weren't meant to bear on your own in the first place. Thank you for sharing with us, Maddie, and thank you, Austin, for sharing your experiences that you've had with fears and anxiety. And it all comes down to this. We were never made to handle the challenges of this world alone. God has created us in such a way that we must learn to go to Him in order to feel the peace that we desire. Yeah. In addition to that, God created us to crave community and acceptance and belonging. And relationships uh, relationship and connection with others is something we all want. It's something that is extremely healthy for us to have. And just because we desire for friendship and belonging doesn't mean it always comes easily to us though. No. And so that's why we want to spend a bit of time talking about loneliness. And take a look again at our story of Jesus to see how he dealt with loneliness. Mm -hmm. so let's read our verse one more time. Matthew 26 verse 40. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. <laughs> Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. See, if we read on, we see that Jesus finds them asleep. Yep. Only moments later. <laughs> in Jesus' hardest moments, his best friends are just busy snoozing. <laughs> it's brutal. So how does Jesus respond in a moment like this when his best friends fail him? The first thing we should note is that Jesus didn't give up on his friends mm -hmm. just because they let him down. Many of us are struggling with loneliness right now, but for some of you, it's because you've been hurt by friends or family in the past. And now you're afraid that the same thing will happen again. Mm -hmm. This is a very real fear, but Jesus' Jesus's example here, and even later when with his best friend Peter betrays him, reminds us that forgiveness might be one of our most powerful weapons against loneliness. There's another guy in the Bible who dealt with the heavy weight of loneliness, whose name was Paul. This guy was constantly in and out of prison because he wasn't afraid to share his faith. Yeah. And that meant he spent so much of his life alone. Just look at how Paul talks about his court date in the Bible as he was being sentenced to prison. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them, but the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength. How brutal is that? Th this incredible guy was completely alone at his court team. And even though he was hurt by it, he says he forgave his friends who were complete no-shows at the time. If you're someone who has made a habit of going solo because you've been burned in the past, the hard truth is that you're likely to end up in a position where you end up getting burned worse. There's another thing we can draw from Jesus' example though. If you f are feeling alone and isolated, but are craving connection, don't give up. 
go and seek out friendship. So many of us resort to feeling sorry for ourselves in those moments and expect someone else to come and rescue us from our loneliness. But the truth is that taking care of our mental health is primarily our responsibility and it's not someone else's. So we're recommending that you find someone else who is in another similar space to that you are, someone else who is also lonely maybe, and that you be the best friend that you can be. Use the feelings and desires that you want in a friendship to guide how you act towards those who are around you. For some of you, it's been a long journey of searching out for your people or even just one person who sees you who you are, sees you as you are. And that's a hard place to be in. And we wanna encourage you and remind you that if you draw near to God, you never need to feel alone, even in the moments when you feel most unnoticed and abandoned. The final thing we see Jesus chose to do when he experienced loneliness was to turn to God in prayer. Mm -hmm. What do you think it looks like to find comfort in God when we are lonely? We are going to give you some time in your groups to talk about it, and then we'll talk about it together after. Welcome back guys. It's important to realize that each of us has been lonely or likely will be lonely at some point. For some of us, it may even feel like those who are closest to us have walked away and left us feeling alone. The comfort God can bring us is that he will never leave us or give up on us. And instead, he promises to bring us strength, love, and guidance. Just listen to what Psalms 27 verse 10 says. It says, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Unlike relying on other people, this promise is something we can be confident in. People will let us down, but God is so different. And it's why our series is called Run to the Father and not Run to Your Parents. <laughs> our desire is for each of us to continue building a habit of going to God in the midst of battles we are facing, whether that is anxiety, mm -hmm. fear, loneliness, or something else. Last week, we talked about the value of identifying verses in the Bible that help us in our moments of struggle, memorizing it and using it in our prayer times. Mm -hmm. This is one of the most powerful weapons we have as Christians. And tonight, we're gonna to be focusing on a verse and, and memorizing a new verse from the mm -hmm. Bible. And so if you have your Bible again, you can turn to 2 Timothy 1.7. Highlight it, mark it down, and this is what the Word of God says. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love 
and of a sound mind. Yeah, so we want you guys to spend time this week learning it and repeating it back until you have it committed to memory. Maybe you want to print it out on a little piece of paper and stick it in your pocket or put it somewhere like on your mirror in the morning or something. And then when you're feeling low or something comes up, you guys could pray this verse. Something like, God, you did not give me a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. I trust that you will see me through. God wants us to run to him. He desires for us to ask for his help in the middle of our struggles. And the good part is he is faithful, he is gracious, and he is kind. So let's pray that today. God, we thankful that you are faithful, that you are gracious, and that you are kind, that you see us in the midst of our fears, our anxieties, and our loneliness, and that you are there with us. We pray today that as we look to your scripture and your promises to find comfort, that those who are hurting most would be able to seek you out and see that you are reliable and dependable, unlike so many other people. God, I pray that those who are lonely as well would be able to find even just one person that they can connect with and uh, have a deep uh, relationship and community with. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks for joining us tonight as we look to the example of Jesus. It's such a blessing to be able to read scripture and see what it looks like to run to our Holy Father. As we wrap up tonight's teaching, we want to remind you that your leaders and our, us youth staff are available to help you process through the big thoughts and emotions you are working through. We love you and we believe in you and we'll see you all soon. See you guys.